In this module two, we're gonna solve the optimal control problem statement we developed in the previous section. Here's that schematic where we have our pursuer and target, and the thing that makes this problem different from module one is that our target has a constant acceleration that's perpendicular to its velocity vector. So we arrived at the simple kinematics last time, z double dot, that's the second derivative of the relative separation between pursuer and target, uh, is equal to target acceleration minus pursuer acceleration. And so we have our kinematic equations, and notably the additional state, that's that state that was not there in section one, is the target acceleration. So here are the state equations again in matrix form, the linear time invariant kinematics, Z1 relative position, Z2 relative velocity, and Z3 target acceleration. And our problem statement was to find the control over the time interval that minimizes a quadratic cost function. There was a terminal cost, and then there was a control effort cost, and we did not have any quadratic state penalty. We're constrained by our kinematics that we just laid out, and this terminal penalty matrix has two positive values along the diagonal denoted by the variables B and C. And we did not have a penalty on target acceleration because we could not control target acceleration. So mathematically, this was the same structure that we had to solve in section one. We just have different kinematics this time and a larger terminal cost matrix. So we're gonna solve this finite horizon linear quadratic regulator. Uh, here is the problem statement to solve now in general. Find the control that minimizes the quadratic cost function subject to the LTI system. And we know, having gone through a, <clears throat> a overview of the linear quadratic theory, that the optimal control is given by the following formula, where key in this is this matrix P of T. It's a time varying matrix, and it's the solution to a differential algebraic Riccati equation. So we need to solve this Riccati equation. We need to get at P of T. How do we do that? Well, we could put in the problem data and solve the dare, but this tends to yield a complicated mess. So instead I tried to transform the Riccati equation by introducing the inverse of P as S like we did in section one. Uh, unfortunately, S was not invertible in that case. So what I ended up doing was applying something called the matrix Hamiltonian equation. Uh, this is another way to solve Riccati equations. Uh, basically, the finite horizon LQR solution is P of T, and that's determined as the product of two square matrices, Y and W. And those two matrices come from the solution of a set of first order ordinary differential equations with a final time boundary condition. And this A matrix, the big A matrix, is called the Hamiltonian matrix, often denoted capital H. And we won't go into the theory of how this is developed, just know that this is the tool that was used to actually solve this Riccati equation. And now we're going to do that. So we substitute in all of the problem data into these elements of the Hamiltonian matrix. And this is what we get, is a bunch of zeros with some minus ones, some ones there, and now we can proceed to systematically solve all of these individual equations in terms of time to go. Remember, final time minus the present time. So writing out each equation now, and then not forgetting our initial conditions. So this is our boundary condition, and actually it's a final time condition, but I say initial condition because I'm gonna transform the independent variable t into time to go so that the final time condition becomes an initial condition. So remember QF is just M and we have our boundary condition which is QF but in terms of time to go then at 
capital T time to go is zero. And so we have P naught now is QF. And that is our initial condition. Breaking that all out into individual terms. Remember we said that W was identity and Y was the terminal matrix. So you can see in the pink uh, characters here, identity and then P and C on the diagonal of Y. So here are our initial conditions for the problem we're going to solve. And now we're going to go through all of these individual differential equations to solve for W and Y. But where do we start now? That's the question, right? Because notice that some of these equations re require us to have problem data that we don't already have. For example, Y12 dot. We can't start there because we don't have Y11. But if we go up to Y11, we go, well, we can integrate that. Sure, that's easy. And we also have the initial condition, B. So we integrate that and we get Y11 is B. And then we can go to Y12 and Y13. And now notice that the right-hand side of the second row of Y depends on Y11, 12, 13. And so we can substitute this data into the right-half side here and then integrate. And then we can do the final row in Y. And now going up to the third row in W. And finally then to the second row in W. And then the first row in W. Finally getting at the integration, the result, uh, W and Y. Okay, we have Y, we have W. To determine P, we just need to invert W. Let's recall matrix inversion by cofactor expansion. So if we have a general three by three matrix A, then we can determine its inverse as its adjoint over its determinant. Here's our adjoint matrix. It's comprised of the minors, uh, their determinants that then result in the cofactors and also our determinant. So here's W, now let's just apply that to the uh, inversion. First, the determinant, and notice that in the third row of W, W31, W32 are zero. So we can eliminate these terms in the determinant. And we're just left with two terms, and also W33 is one. So we have just the following expression to substitute in the corresponding polynomials in W to arrive at the determinant. Pretty, pretty darn straightforward there. Uh, and then now the adjoint, a good place to start is with the simple stuff, the ones and the zeros. It'll help simplify it a bit. Okay, now we need to take those elements of W and put them into that matrix appropriately. So this process of substituting gives us then the inverse of W. We have the adjoint and the braces multiplied by one over the determinant that we determined previously. Now going back to the solution to the Riccati equation, Y times W inverse. Notice that we have the zeros kind of identified since we did W inverse and we've previously done Y. So here's our solution P in general. But before we start to substitute in all of the elements, all of those polynomials for Y, you know, IJ, W inverse IJ, Let's actually look at what's needed for the optimal control. There's our optimal control formula. And really what's needed is based off of what's in that R matrix and B matrix. When you multiply R inverse B transpose P together, notice that we just have the second row of P. We don't actually have to evaluate all of the elements of P with the polynomial substitution. We just need to do it for the second row. And that second row of P is also minus K in the state feedback law. U star is minus KX. So here's P, there's our second row, there's the data, there's the polynomials that we can substitute in, and we'd simply do that. And we get minus K in doing so. And group some terms, and finally add in that determinant on the denominator to finally come up with our general optimal control solution for our accelerating problem statement. That optimal control is determined in 
in terms of the variables B and C, those are penalties on the relative distance and relative velocity of the pursuer and target at the final time, at the time to intercept. It's a state feedback law. You can see the states Z1, Z2, Z3 fed back from the kinematics to the guidance and the guidance outputting U star. The guidance has three time varying gains in it. Those time varying gains are the coefficients in front of each of the Z states divided by that determinant. Now, let's take this one step further and look at the case of maximum intercept effort, where we're letting the penalty at the intercept time go to infinity, that's B go to infinity. So in taking these limits, I want to uh, multiply by B over B and simplify this expression. So now B goes to infinity, C goes to zero, a bunch of stuff cancels. And all we're really left with is a fairly simplified expression. Uh, we can write it as three over times to go times uh, these three terms in the braces. And in fact, what we've determined is augmented proportional navigation. It has an optimal gain of three. We have a relative position, relative velocity, target acceleration. And look at what the first two terms are. They're exactly what we had in section one. It's simply true proportional navigation that's been augmented by a third term. Zero effort miss needs to be updated because for augmented proportional navigation, we have an accelerating target. So <clears throat> our objective is to determine what this ZEM is. We can determine the position of the target and the position of the pursuer at the final time t by simply integrating the target acceleration, where the target acceleration is constant, and the pursuer vertical component of its velocity, the z dot sub p. Note that z dot, z dot sub p at the present time, lowercase t, that's going to be assumed to be a constant value as time to go approaches zero. That's a zero effort miss at that instant. So we take the integrals and notice that naturally time to go appears. So now grouping things together, we can see we have Z1, we have Z2, and we have Z3. And behold, Z1 plus Z2 time to go plus Z3 time to go, the thing in the braces in augmented pronav is actually also zero effort miss perpendicular to the line of sight direction for an accelerating target. And we've denoted that accelerating target with a superscript A here. Again, zero effort miss is the miss distance that results if the pursuer continues on its present heading at time lowercase t all the way to capital T. In summary, we have our optimal augmented pronav with the optimal gain of three. We have its zero effort miss form where we've substituted in our formula for zero effort miss. By the way, this is the same formula as what we determined in the previous section. We just have different definitions now of ZEM. And in general, if we don't want to use the optimal gain value of three, but maybe some other gain, well, we replace that with N and that's our general form of augmented pronav. In this third case, I've written it in terms of line of sight. Remember in section one that we showed that the first two terms in the top augmented proportional navigation equation, Z1 plus Z2 time to go, that's just true pronav. The first term in the bottom equation, this is just true pronav. So indeed, we are augmenting true pronav with some acceleration term. In the next section, we're going to simulate and analyze augmented proportional navigation and compare it to true proportional navigation.